It's the middle of December in 2023, and it's fair to say that things have been exceedingly busy in the last couple of weeks. Today, I've made sure my pen is freshly filled with ink, the colourful wax is gently heating over a candle flame, the address book is handy, and I have a stack of Christmas cards to write. Whether you like the tradition or not, most of us will probably write or receive at least one card this season, even if we don't celebrate Christmas. Deciding who to send cards to and making a list of recipients got me thinking about friendships. Although we might want them to stay the same forever, they don't. People change and have wildly different experiences across the course of their lives. Friendships are no exception. They alter and go through seasons and sometimes out of your life completely. They can be intense, giddy, euphoric and a source of frustration. The discovery that you weren't as important to somebody as you thought can cut very deeply, sometimes leaving scars which we carry around much longer than after the ending of romantic relationships. It's easy to feel wistful during the darkest days of the year. The holiday adverts and billboards send us the same message. December is a time for meeting up and reaching out. But I think it's just as likely that we'll miss people too. Or at least miss the feeling you used to have when spending time with old friends, which now seems impossible to recreate. Now, I don't want to sound maudlin, and of course, some of the best friendships do endure through all those life changes. So I do hope that you find peace with your friends as this year draws to a close. Today's story is about friendship and loss and ties which are so strong they do endure even beyond the grave. So pour a dot of sealing wax onto your first envelope and press an intricate seal into it as it cools and gather close around the fire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take With a down, dairy, 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 down, down Welcome to episode 29 of the Three Ravens podcast. I'm Eleanor Conlon and I'm stuffing the devil into the toe of a boot and I'm joined by my co-host Martin Vaux who's holding it still for me. I think we've got him! Uh, Hello everyone! (laughs) It's been quite a busy December so far here at the Three Ravens Nest. I'm now well into my run of Christmas shows so I've been singing and sparkling as a winter princess every day and otherwise we've been finding time to stuff in the occasional mince pie and slice of panettone and get ready for Christmas. Yep, the halls are well and truly decked. We're feeling rather in the mood, aren't we? We've also been releasing daily episodes of our Advent adventures since last Tuesday, Mm -hmm. loosely inspired by the 12 Days of Christmas song so we hope very much that you're enjoying a daily dose of Three Ravens. Christmas cracker, if you will. (laughs) We've had some great correspondence this week, which we'll talk about a bit later, including entries to our Three Ravens Flash Fiction competition. Oh, yeah. If you'd like to enter to just write up to 1,000 words of a folklore or fairy tale inspired original story, and we'll share them on the podcast. Just send your entries to threeravenspodcast at gmail.com and we'll add them to the ever-expanding library of your stories. We also have a lovely new Patreon subscriber to thank this week, Maria. All hail Maria, King of Patreon. (laughs) If you would like to join in the fun on Patreon for our monthly newsletter, all the episodes completely ad-free and exclusive episodes like the Snow Queens episode, which we released last Thursday, please consider subscribing at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast for $3 or $6 a month. We're looking forward to our Three Ravens Film Club film for December, 1965's Kwai Dan. So do watch that and send us your thoughts if you'd like to join in. Now we'll get to correspondence at the end of the episode, but if you would like to send us in thoughts, weird or wonderful bits of folklore or your own stories, please drop us an email at threeravenspodcast at gmail.com or join us on social media at facebook.com forward slash threeravenspodcast, Instagram at threeravenspodcast or on x at threeravenspod. 
Now, we're releasing this episode on the 18th of December, which is, drumroll please, a bit of a nothing day. Oh, no! It's not terrible, because it's still an official part of Saturnalia, the week-long Roman festival of eating, drinking, attending orgies, and generally doing things you'd rather nobody remembered in the new year. Yeah, while Saturnalia has sadly vanished into the annals of time, I feel that that's still very much the vibe for a lot of Christmas parties. Yes, (laughs) definitely. But if you see your colleagues doing something embarrassing while under the influence of too much eggnog, Be the better person and keep quiet about it. What happens in Saturnalia stays in Saturnalia. I'm surprised there are no saints days. Well, there are a few recorded on the Catholic calendar of saints, but they are very minor ones. And honestly, talking about their exploits would be scraping the barrel a bit. Sure. But yesterday, the 17th of December, was Sow's Day, which I think we referred to before. Basically, this was the day sows were slaughtered in readiness for Yule. And of course, a couple of days ago on the 16th, we get the boar's head feast. Now, Eleanor and I did attend a boar's head feast in hastily thrown together 14th century costumes and we put a picture up on social media so you can see our exploits. I was about to say sadly, but I'm not actually sad about this. We don't have a real boar's head. Well, no. But my dad does have a very beautiful vintage Majolica ceramic dish with a lid in the shape of a boar's head, which is a lot better as you can fill it with whatever you like. Yep. So celebrating the boar's head feast doesn't need to exclude vegetarians. Caput apri deferens. <laughs> now, as it's a bit of a nothing day, I suppose we'll have to rouse the county criers from their Saturnalian hangover and get them to bring us into Buckinghamshire. Yes, but be gentle. They're looking rather fragile. Buckinghamshire is located in the southeast of England. It's one of the home counties as it borders Greater London. It's surrounded by Northamptonshire to the north, Bedfordshire to the northeast, Hertfordshire to the east, Berkshire to the south, Greater London to the southeast, and Oxfordshire to the west, so totally surrounded. Ooh. The largest settlement is Milton Keynes, although the county town is actually Aylesbury. Martin, do you have any associations with Buckinghamshire? Absolutely none whatsoever, I have to say. It's a place that I've heard of, obviously, but yep, couldn't tell you a thing about it. Well, I don't either, really, other than that I've toured a show to Milton Keynes, but it was very much a one-stop, went to the theatre, worked, went home. Sure. So I haven't seen much of it. As far as I can tell from my research, however, it is a very beautiful county. The Chiltern Hills, which we've talked about before because they flow into some of the other surrounding counties, Mm -hmm. occupy the south of Buckinghamshire. And their highest point is Haddington Hill, which does actually fall within Buckinghamshire's bounds. And I'm guessing there are quite a lot of rivers in Buckinghamshire as it's totally surrounded? Yes. Parts of two of the four longest rivers in England, the Thames and the Great Ouse. The county can actually be kind of split into two sections, if you can imagine. The south leads from the River Thames up the Chiltern hills which are quite gentle but there are steeper slopes on the northern side leading up to the vale of aylesbury which is in the southern area of the river great ooze the chilterns are also the source of the river oozel which joins the great ooze oh wow it sounds like buckingham's coat of arms should maybe feature a river (laughs) well it almost does its traditional flag features a white swan in chains on a background of red and black why is the swan in chains because swans are fish royal and belong to the monarch yeah Uh, so the chains demonstrate that the swan is not free it's it's a belonging Uh, and that's an ancient law which still applies to wild swans in england now as discussed in our seven swans a swimming episode (laughs) yes the swans were traditionally bred in buckinghamshire for the king's pleasure after they became the king's property at the order of William the Conqueror. Now, it seems almost petty. Like, he'd taken the country already. Why did he have to declare himself owner of the swans? Well, he was particularly vigorous at annexing Buckinghamshire. He took most of it for his own direct family. Really? So Odo of Bayer, who was William's half-brother, became a major Buckinghamshire landowner. Oh, see, this feels apropos for yesterday's Advent Adventure when we talked about our seven swans are swimming. Yes. Buckinghamshire's coat of arms also features a chain swan, in addition to a gold band with white leaf cross in the centre, which is one of Buckinghamshire's ancient landmarks, and I will talk more about that in a bit. Sure. The shield on the arms is topped by a beech tree, which represents the Chiltern Forest, and there's also a buck for Buckingham. 
We first see these arms in use at the Battle of Agincourt, where they were carried by the Duke of Buckingham. Oh, it sounds like quite a powerful coat of arms, I must say. Is there a suitable county motto to go with it? There is. Vestigia nullo retrosum, which means no going back. Ooh. Which is very determined, if a little reckless. So, what's the earliest history we know about Buckinghamshire? The county's name is Anglo-Saxon and means the place of Bucker's home. OK, and so who's Bucker? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> Someone who lived exactly there. <laughs> but archaeologists have found much earlier evidence of settlement. There's actually quite a lot of places in the county which still have Brythonic names. So evidence of quite a thriving settlement before the Roman invasion still exists. Well, that's quite rare, so got places isn't it? like Penn, yeah. Wendover, Brill... And digs in Aylesbury suggest habitation at least as early as 1500 BC. Woof. And there's a lot of pre-Roman earthworks all over the county. Cunobelinus, who was an ancient king of the Catavalloni tribe who we've talked about before, yeah. was actually based in that area. And there's still a group of villages known as the Kimballs, named after him. So he was the one who inspired Shakespeare's play Cymbeline, wasn't he? Yes, Shakespeare's foray into early British history. Mm. That makes me sound sceptical. I really like the play, actually, but it's not a great source of real historical events. Sounds as though there was quite a lot going on there pre-Romans, Though. Yes, certainly. Milton Keynes, as we know it now, was inhabited as early as 2000 BC and they've excavated several burial sites from that period. In Blue Bridge, flint tools from the Middle Stone Age have been found, quite close to a huge 18 metre diameter roundhouse, which they've managed to date to the early Iron Age, about 700 BC. Oh, that's really cool. And I'm guessing the valleys and rivers made it an attractive place to settle, basically. Good farming because of floodplains and so on and so forth. Absolutely. And also its proximity to London and its links with other parts of Britain. Mm. The Romans seemed to use it primarily as a crossing point, actually. There are still Roman roads crossing the county today, including the famous Watling Street and Aikman Street. The Romans would have also used the Icknield Way, which predates their arrival. And so were there many Roman settlements in what we call Buckinghamshire? Not, it seems, as much as the Anglo-Saxons after them, who were probably the most influential on Buckinghamshire's history. It actually didn't become the historic county until the Saxons. It was a subdivision of the Kingdom of Wessex right. and formed of about 200 communities to defend against the Danes. Most of the places in the county still bear Anglo-Saxon names, but really interestingly, the actual layout of the county as it is today is pretty much exactly as it was in the Anglo-Saxon period. Whoa, so we could visit and tour around Buckinghamshire and more or less be following in the footsteps of Anglo-Saxons. Yeah. We know that it was a major place for them because Whoa. a royal palace was built at Brill and battles over land were fought there, which were considered worthy of mention in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. It's fairly major. Yeah, that all makes Buckinghamshire an attractive target for Billy the Conks, I suppose. Oh, yes. You can certainly see why he wanted to keep it in the family mm. by giving it to Odo of Bayer. I get you, right. By the time the Doomsday Survey was taken in 1086, it was an incredibly wealthy county, with quite a lot of it owned either directly by the monarch or the monarch's relatives. And I suppose with its proximity to London, by river and so on and so forth, that, that all makes sense. That only continued under our favourite person, Henry VIII. Boo! Boo! <laughs> Eleanor and I actually have quite a nice little velvety... Christmas decoration set of Henry VIII and his wives. But we always hang Henry VIII at the back of the Christmas tree so we don't have to him a lesson. look at him. Yeah. <laughs> so Henry absorbed more of Buckinghamshire into his enormous person. Indeed. The dissolution <laughs> of the monasteries in 1536 provided a very convenient excuse to take lots of local abbeys and manors in the name of the crown mm. and almost a third of Buckinghamshire became Henry's personal property. What? He's also the one who made Aylesbury the County town. See, I was wondering why it wasn't Buckingham, because it, it should be Buckingham. It's Buckinghamshire. It should be, and it was. But Henry did this to please Thomas Boleyn, uh. apparently, to smooth the way towards marrying his daughter Anne Boleyn. Uh, hey, hey, Thomas, is it okay if I call you Dad? <laughs> yeah, have have Aylesbury as your new county town. <laughs> so you are. Buckingham must have been pretty annoyed by this. <laughs> yeah, but Aylesbury had the last laugh, despite poor Anne Boleyn's tragic end. It's still the county town today. And what about during the Civil War? How did Buckinghamshire feel about that, given you know, most of the country was owned by the monarch? Surprise. 
surprisingly, it was actually mostly parliamentarians. Really? Maybe so not they surprisingly. didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, maybe the people of Buckinghamshire were fed up of the royals by that point. There were actually quite a few active conflicts in Buckinghamshire because John Hamden lived there. I have to say, I don't remember or maybe even know who John Hamden is. So who's John Hamden? Well, he was a really important figure to the beginning of the First Civil War. He was very vocal about his opposition to Charles I's new taxes, which made him a national figure. Ah. And he was actually Oliver Cromwell's cousin. Right. And it was his arrest, along with the other four members of Parliament who protested against these taxes, which actually sparked the First Civil War. I see. And he raised a regiment which fought at the battles of Edgehill and Brentford, but he was sadly killed at the Battle of Chalgrove in 1643. Oh, that's interesting. Now, I'm wondering if we could compile all our Civil War sections into a kind of super episode about well, the Civil War. There's actually enough folklore surrounding the history of the Civil War, so we probably could. Now, we usually stop well before the advent of the modern world, but did <laughs> anything interesting or particularly notable happen in Buckinghamshire in the 18th and 19th centuries? Well, in the Industrial Revolution, the county gained a lot of railways, which meant the landscape was radically altered. And Buckinghamshire was actually important for the construction of railway carriages too. There's a big industry oh, that's of that there. Yeah. The lace industry was also pretty huge there and made such nice lace that it was even popular with Queen Victoria, Aww. who supposedly preferred it to edge her pillows. <laughs> Can you imagine? There's lots of people starving up and down the country and all over the goes, empire. Nothing but Buckinghamshire lace will do to edge my pillows. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> In addition to industry, agriculture had pretty much been the mainstay. We've talked about you know rivers being good for farming, mm. uh, but it did suffer a huge blight in the early Victorian period, thanks to a double whammy of agricultural famine and a cholera epidemic. Oh no, well I suppose if you've got a lot of water then cholera, yeah. Yeah, makes it's sense. a bit of a hazard. Uh. So lots of people migrated away from the Buckinghamshire countryside after that, which resulted in a bit of a property crash. Ooh. Meaning that new owners could buy land very cheaply, including the Rothschild family who built or did up loads of amazing houses. Now, I think most of us will probably have heard of the Rothschild Lots of conspiracy theories swirl around mm -hmm. them. They were a famous banking family, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Now, yes. I, I think their history starts as early as the 16th century, but they really came into prominence in the 18th century, establishing banks all over Europe. And they first settled in England in, I think, like the 18th century, late 18th century, mm -hmm. when one of the sons, Nathan Rothschild, and his family moved to England to expand the family business. Well, we're very lucky that he did because the Rothschilds are the reason we have so many of the magnificent stately homes in Buckinghamshire today. Really? Yeah, there's Ascot House, Aston Clinton House, Aethrop, Mentmore Towers and Woodston Manor, to name but a few. Ooh. There are some pretty startling properties too, often in different architectural styles. Wadston Manor, for example, is built in a neo-Renaissance style, supposedly inspired by French chateau, while Mentmore Towers, which is the largest English Rothschild house, has Jacobean style architecture. Well, they sure had a lot of houses, I wonder. Is it a conspiracy? <laughs> They certainly did, and it may well be. But <laughs> Buckinghamshire's status as a home county means that there are any number of other stately homes there too, which aren't associated with the Rothschilds. Mm. There's Hewenden Manor, which was the home of Benjamin Disraeli. Dorney Court, a Tudor manor house, which was remodelled in the Victorian era to look medieval. Well, that's confusing. Yes, <laughs> indeed. We also have Cliveden, West Wickham Park, Claydon House, and of course, the Prime Minister's country retreat, Chequers. I discovered only the other day that Chequers was actually built around 1565, which is so much earlier than I thought. Yeah, it's actually a very old house and one whose walls must hold incredible secrets. Yeah, I bet. Prime Ministers aside... I'm much more interested in the fact it contains a very large collection of Oliver Cromwell memorabilia because Cromwell's grandson actually lived there at one what? point. But it didn't actually become the Prime Minister's residence until 1917 when it was given to the nation. Oh, this is interesting because prior to that point in history, Prime Ministers had been from landed gentry for the most part. So they had their own stately homes. But the 20th century saw the rise of a new breed of politician, along with the rise of labour movements, basically, who didn't necessarily come with a large estate attached. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Honestly, the blog for this week's episode is going to be so beautiful because <laughs> there are so many stunning buildings in Buckinghamshire. Oh, how nice. I haven't yet mentioned Borstall Tower, which is a 
14th century moated gatehouse with lovely gardens. Borstal is normally where you know naughty children are sent. Ah, it? it's not spelt quite the same. Oh, okay. It's B O A R S T A L L, right. and its name comes from the legend that Edward the Confessor gave the piece of land to one of his men who killed a wild boar for him. Oh, so cool! Literally the stalling of the boar. Wicked. There was once a manor there, but only the tower remains now. And of course, I can't not mention the infamous Bletchley Park near Milton Keynes. Ah, yes, Bletchley Park, home of the Colossus, the world's first programmable electronic digital computer. And it's famous for, of course, being the site of British code breaking during World War II, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. It has a fascinating history and is well worth reading up about. And I believe you can go and visit too. OK, Eleanor, I feel like we've been absolutely spoiled for stately homes, but how are we doing on religious buildings? Do we have any cathedrals in Bletchley? Well, Sure. You may be surprised to discover there are actually no cathedrals in Buckinghamshire, hmm. but there is another tree cathedral. Really? They seem to be cropping up everywhere now. Or growing up everywhere. <laughs> growing up everywhere. <laughs> There's one at Newlands near Milton Keynes, which is based on the outline of Norwich Cathedral, strangely, oh. and uses different species of trees to represent the different sections of the cathedral. <sighs> I really want to see one of these places. I we know, must we go must. soon. There's also a wealth of beautiful historic churches, including St. Lawrence's at Bruton, where they've discovered medieval wall paintings. One of those great stories where they stripped off the Victorian plaster and were agog to discover these gorgeous paintings. I love all that stuff. Buckingham Chantry Chapel, which is supposedly the oldest building in Buckingham. And St. Michael's Church in Chenies, which is built on the site of a 12th century wooden church. And you can still see the 12th century font. Whoa, 12th century font. That sounds cool. So I'm getting the sense that you could continue with this interactive tour of Buckinghamshire's historic sites, Eleanor, but... I want folklore. Give me folklore. We will get Mm -hmm. there. (laughs) But before we get stuck in, I do just want to say that a lot of interesting people have lived in Buckinghamshire over the centuries. And it's particularly been a haven for writers. You'll like this because Mary Shelley and Percy Bysshe lived in Marlowe for a while. I do like that. John Milton lived in Chalfont St Giles and you can still visit his cottage. I like that too. Jerome K. Jerome also lived at Marlowe and so did T.S. Eliot. Yeah, that's pretty cool. While Roald Dahl lived at Great Missenden, Enid Blyton in B. Beaconsfield and Terry Pratchett was also born in Beaconsfield and there's loads of others too. Uh, There must be something in the water in Buckinghamshire. We better relocate at once to improve our writing. Um, Do you think the Rothschilds could spare us a stately home? Hmm, don't know, let's ask. (laughs) (laughs) Now Buckinghamshire does have quite a bit of folklore on offer too and there's a particular creature associated with the county which I don't think I've encountered anywhere else yet. I'm talking about the Little Witches. Well, I mean, I know you, Eleanor. I've definitely encountered at least one little witch. Much smaller than me. Oh, OK. These Little Witches are small figures with large heads and long arms. Ooh. And I don't have long arms. They're rather similar <laughs> to fairy or fae folk rather oh, than witches, okay. you think of them, as they love to dance and they're said to be able to hypnotise sheep. Say what? So they can be <laughs> spotted all about the Buckinghamshire fields, sitting on gates or on the hurdles of sheepfolds. Right. And often to be spied making faces at the sheep and distracting them from feeding. They sound naughty. They've also been spotted dancing at moonlight and are described as being not quite half the height of a walking stick. Whoa. They're quite little yeah. with very long thin legs and they can also run very fast. I've got to say they sound pretty fun. I think you would get along with these little witches. They do and they're differentiated from just everyday person sized witches in various different accounts. I mean those are there too of course. There's a classic example of a witch on Aethrop Hill who overlooked a carter's horses and made them stop halfway up the hill. The carter noticed this old woman watching him, but he acted very decisively, taking his horse whip and hitting her so hard that he drew blood. And the horses were fine after that. And so it's common knowledge in that area that when the blood flows, the spell is broken. Oh, that's cool. When the blood flows, the spell is broken. Blimey. Yeah, brutal, but apparently very effective. (laughs) Now, it's always a bit of a thrill for us to discover a raven story. And there's one from the church at West Drayton. In 1749, churchgoers were troubled by strange noises from the vaults below the church. And when the sexton went to investigate, he found a large raven perched on one of the coffins. Oh, I'm loving this. It was seen often after that, pecking and fluttering around inside the vault. On other occasions, it was seen inside the church itself, sitting on pews and flying round the chancel. 
The parishioners tried to catch the raven, but whenever they came close, the bird mysteriously vanished. Hmm. A legend formed that the bird was actually the restless spirit of a murderer who then committed suicide, who had accidentally been buried on consecrated grounds instead of at the crossroads with a stake through his heart. Do you know what I'm going to call that? A rook. Key mistake. Oh, no. <laughs> How long have you been waiting to make that pun? About, about 10 seconds. <laughs> the bird <laughs> continued to appear, though, usually on Fridays, which was even more unlucky. Really? And people came to associate it with a bad omen. I think poor ravens, they do get a bad rap sometimes. They do, don't they? Mm. But hey, at least there are warnings. Yes, that's true. The spectral forces seem to play fair that way in Buckinghamshire. <laughs> We've also got an account of a woman seeing a little figure figure like a doll, dressed in silk and satin, walking down the lane just before her mother died. Oh, that's pretty random. When she told her father, he said, there is always a warning. There is always a warning. <laughs> it feels like this is a county of portents. Yes, it does. <laughs> Although the little figure, I don't know how sinister that really is. Well, it kind of sounds like one of those little witches just done up for a night out, doesn't <laughs> I it? I know, right? <laughs> There's also a tale of a Buckinghamshire farmer who vividly dreamed of being accidentally shot by his own gun, only to die that way the following Tuesday. Oh, so yeah, possibly that something in the water comment we made a little while ago. It is about the gift of presentiment, isn't it? Well, they need it, as there's been one or two grisly murders in the county. Really? Jib Lane at Calverton is haunted by the ghost of Lady Grace Bennett, who was the owner of a manor house at the north end of Calverton. Lady Grace was brutally murdered by a covetous butcher called Adam Barnes. Oh, she was butchered. He was butchered by Adam Barnes. He wanted to get his hands on all her money. And so he killed her in the servants' hall of her home and escaped over the wall into Jib Lane. But he was caught and hanged. His body was suspended in a gibbet, hence the name of the lane. Right, with <laughs> And you can see the site of where it happened as there are carvings in the stone wall there with the date 1693. But Lady Grace still haunts the area, walking Whoa, up and down wow, Jib cool Lane. And spooky story. It's to gloat at uh, yeah. Adam Barnes as he hung there in his gibbet. Oh, well, yeah. As you might, I suppose, if you'd been viciously killed for your cash. Now, Eleanor, you briefly mentioned West Wickham earlier. I think I'm right in saying that might have been the one-time home of the Hellfire Club. Yes, that's right. <laughs> now, this is so interesting, and I might have to save some of this for when it's my turn to talk about Buckinghamshire, but needless to say, we're not talking about the Dungeons & Dragons Club in Stranger Things or the Secret Society in The X-Men. No, the actual Hellfire Club was a society of rakes established by a chap called Francis Dashwood. It was named after the Hellfire Caves, which tunnelled into the earth below the village of West Wickham, which I realise now is in Buckinghamshire. And it was there where members gathered to engage in all sorts of naughty stuff, from blasphemous rituals to lavish orgies. I mean, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> like a party. Doesn't it? Actually, quite a few members of Parliament were involved hmm. in the Hellfire Club. Nothing really changes, does it? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to pursue a more solemn note and tell you about the Grave of the Martyr at Amersham, Ooh, which really? has a horrible story attached. The Protestant martyr William Scrivener was burned at the stake there in 1521, but his own children were actually forced to set fire oh, to him. come off it. That's horrid. It's awful, isn't it? Well, completely understandably, there's a spot of ground where he was burned burnt on which crops never flourish no. even now the field around it happily grows but that spot remains dead and barren oh that's nasty that is isn't it <laughs> well in a slightly similar vein although a bit more wholesome there used to be a landmark in aston clinton called the shepherd's grave which is apparently the place a shepherd named faithful loved to sit Aww. after he died his fellow shepherds buried him there and cut an epitaph into the turf of which only the word faithful remained as late as 1847, but it has since been ploughed away oh, by the come farmer. Oh, they ploughed it away. They ploughed it away. Ah, curse you, march of progress. <laughs> I mentioned Borstall Tower before, but there are some other legends attached to it as well as its origin, including the reason the main manor house no longer exists. Go on. Sir John Aubrey, the owner, is said to have destroyed the house after... This is 
horrible. His five-year-old son was mistakenly given rat poison instead of sugar in his porridge and died. Oh my God, that is horrendous. It's quite the mistake, oh, isn't it? No. Um, and Sir John never recovered from the shock and demolished the house. Yeah, understandably. What a terrible thing to happen. Is it awful? And also it feels like maybe not a mistake. Mm. Just wondering if the, uh, the nurse who was in charge of that five-year-old knew exactly what she was doing. Goodness. But his ancestor, an older Sir John Aubrey, is also associated with a lost bell story oh, from yeah. the area. Yeah, so when Charles I's royalist forces took control of the area during the Civil War, he wrote and demanded that the bells from Borstal Church be sent to him to be melted down for gunmetal. Uh, they did that a lot, didn't they? Mm, they did. Well, Sir John wasn't having it. He took the bells down, but apparently hid them down a well and told the king that they'd gone missing in transit so oh, the king wouldn't be able to have them. Awesome. But then after the Civil War, they couldn't find the bells. They never found them again. No way. Yeah. So theoretically, they're like at the bottom of the well. Somewhere, but we don't oh, know where the well was. So, so they might still be down there or somebody might just have stolen them. Well, if you happen to go near Borstal, everyone, do listen out for a ghostly ringing yes. deep within the earth. <laughs> the mystery of the Borstal bells. <laughs> And wild boar, actually, or at least boar-shaped beasts, do seem to have been a bit of a problem in Buckinghamshire. Really? Apparently, the Chetwood family were allowed to take a toll for all cattle passing along their local roads because one of them had killed a terrible beast which had been annoying the whole neighbourhood. They did actually hold on to the jaw of this beast, which was a very large boar, and an immense boar skeleton was also discovered there when a field was dug up in 1810. See, we forget in these civilised times what a menace boar could be. Uh, People are obviously really keen to bring back boar, and I'm excited that there are more boar in the world. But they used to kill people. They used to be really dangerous. I imagine uh, the medieval boar was a much bigger creature and they were so dangerous because they're quite vicious. They will attack you, won't they? If they spot you and think that you're on their territory, they'll they'll go for you. They're perfectly happy to eat human flesh as well. Let's not forget. Oh, yeah. I mean, pigs will basically (laughs) eat anything, Mm, won't they? Definitely. (laughs) Now, I told you that King Cymbeline or Cunibelinus of the Cat of Valoni had his HQ in Buckinghamshire. Yeah. And there is still the remains of a fort, actually quite near Chequers, called Cymbeline. Cymbeline's Mount. Ooh. Local folklore says that if you run around the mound seven times, the devil will appear. Oh, like Chanctonbury Ring. Mm-hmm. Mm. And people still say that the site has a strange, unearthly feeling about it. <sighs> Some of these ancient forts can be really eerie places, can't they? I'm not sure I'd volunteer to camp under the stars at an ancient fort. No, indeed. <laughs> Cymbeline is not the only royal who has historic shenanigans in Buckinghamshire either. There is a tradition that a piece of dark red velvet in Hedgeley Church is actually a piece of Charles I's cloak. Mm. Before the Civil War, Charles I was regarded in some quarters as a saint with the gift of healing. Rubbish. So, (laughs) yes, but it might have been treasured for that reason. Mm. Alternately, it might have been an altar cloth. We don't know. But it does date from that period. Um, There are also loads of legends surrounding Fair Rosamond or Rosamond Clifford, who was Henry II's mistress. Interesting. Uh, Fair Rosamond is the subject of a lot of folklore, including some truly lurid tales of how she was supposedly murdered by Queen Eleanor. Oh, no. Well, I mean, Eleanors don't murder, do they? Very factually inaccurate. (laughs) I must insist as Eleanors don't murder. (laughs) But uh, we do know the Clifford family lived there and there are several different locations in Buckinghamshire which were meant to be Rosamond's bowers, otherwise known as sexy retreats in which she could spend some time with the king. No way. At any rate, she obviously liked it there because there are various accounts of her ghost appearing at Creslow Manor House and in other places. My goodness, there really is an absolute wealth in Buckinghamshire, isn't there? There is. And I haven't yet talked about Solbury Standing Stone, which supposedly rolls down the hill it stands on every night at midnight only to reappear the next morning at the top of the hill. That sounds so cool. There's also the Hand of St. James as in the Apostle, Jesus' buddy which you can see at St. Peter's Church in Marlow. I know about this one. Yes, because it's tied with a very nice little ribbon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's I think it's mummified. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a preserved hand, yeah. um, basically. Uh, there are pictures available for the strong of stomach what? if you if you want to look that one up. <laughs> and there's also a story of the screaming pigs of Cholesbury Camp. 
I mean, pink scream fairly frequently. Why is this special? Well, to clarify, um, there are no actual pigs. Oh, they're um, ghost pigs? It's just a terrible wailing noise which emanates from an Iron Age hill fort after well, dusk. We haven't had a ghost pig for a minute or two. No, they, they have, a few have cropped up, but... Um, In past episodes, but not for a while. Random wailing pigs at a hill fort. OK, well, you can remind me to give Cholesbury Camp a miss. I don't want ghost pigs anywhere near me, frankly. No. <laughs> Grim's Ditch, too. It's Grim's Ditch. That's ancient, a good name. It's a great name. It's an ancient earthwork running from Knapp Hill in Buckinghamshire as far as Dunstable in Bedfordshire, which Whoa. I talked about two episodes yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Local superstition believes that Grimm's Ditch was the handiwork of wizards because no earthly power could have dug such a long, deep trench. Faultless logic. Yeah, I love that leap. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, isn't it? People also used to believe, speaking of faultless logic, that the ditch ran all the way around the world like a serpent. Fantastic. And also that nothing of good omen ever happened along its <laughs> and that fairies and ghosts frolicked there at night. Ah, oh, see, the name Grimm is often associated with bad omens, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Although I do also think it has a connection to the god Woden or Odin. Yes, that's right. Um, although it's not a deeply auspicious name for an uh, earthwork, is no, it? that's true. <laughs> now, we often talk about the Christianization of older ideas on the podcast. Yeah. And there's an excellent example of a landmark in Buckinghamshire which may have been subject to just that. Tell me more. The White Leaf Cross, which features on the county coat of arms, that I mentioned earlier is a roughly cross-shaped hill carving on Whiteleaf Hill. However, due to its triangular base, historians have posited that it may well have been a large phallic shape, what? which was later altered to appear more cross-like. Oh, fantastic. I guess the pious villagers didn't really care for a hundred foot high phallus beaming down upon them. <laughs> There is a Neolithic barrow on the same hill, but there's no evidence of any connection between the two. I bet the local people absolutely loved having it there. It was the church that was like, no, we need to cut a cross in the top of this <laughs> yes. and make it something different. <laughs> now, Eleanor, there's one thing that's bothering me. Why were you trying to stuff the devil into a boot at the beginning of the episode? I was doing it in honour of Sir John Shaw, uh -huh. who was the rector of North Marston in Buckinghamshire in the 14th century. He wasn't a saint, but he was still responsible for a number of miracles, including miraculously curing people's toothache and gout and so forth. So he was a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> he also discovered a holy well during a season of drought by striking the earth near the church with mm -hmm. a staff. Lucky break. And as well as giving people the water they needed, the well's waters were also supposed to have healing properties. Mm. And he is said to have cast the devil out by stuffing him into a boot. Well, I wonder if that's why somehow it's difficult for me to get my boots on in the morning. Because the devil's inside. Yeah, there's a devil hiding in there. <laughs> well, I was delighted to find out more about Sir John Sean because I'd actually encountered him before without realising and not in Buckinghamshire. Really? There's a medieval painting of him on the roof screen of St Gregory's Church in Sudbury, which is in Suffolk, and I'll put a picture of it on the blog because it's excellent. Mm -hmm. I visited the church at random and was very taken by the picture of this grinning chap stuffing the devil into the toe of a boot. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and I was reading that the devil in a boot story is said to be the origin of the jack-in-a-box toy with the monstrous figure that pops no out. No way! I mean, a jack-in-a-boot sounds brilliant. I bet we could make a killing selling jack-in-a-boots on Etsy. I know, let's start. <laughs> <laughs> Bucky and Sheer has a lot of interesting folk legends and really only scratch the surface here but now it's time for a quick breather and I'll start spinning my yarn right after this It was easy to forget the desperation of war as we sat in the cosy parlour at the Christopher Inn in Eton drinking brandy and reminiscing I was glad to see my major again, as I always am. Although war with the Dutch was a memory now, and it was some time since either of us had seen active service, nothing brings men close like the immediacy of conflict, the terror and excitement of bombardment, of rapidly changing orders, of the knowledge that any moment one friend might be lost, leaving a void in the other's life. At that time, I thought that the person living with that empty space at his side might have been the Major, as I was wounded in the attack on the fort where we were stationed, and though the wound proved to be superficial, I did not know that in the moment. I was caught in the shoulder by a bullet, 
and would have been cut down as I lay in my own blood by the Dutchman who had fired the shot. He stood teetering on the top of his ladder, levelling his musket at me, but in a moment he was toppling backwards and falling to his death below as the Major drove his shining sword deep into the enemy's heart. He had rushed to my side, and I remember how blue the sky was that day as he leaned over me, pressing his hands to my wound to staunch the blood, his arms supporting my weight. I opened my mouth to say farewell to him, thinking my life was about to ebb away, but he pressed his hands still harder to the flow of blood. Stay with me, William. Today is not the day your soul will go to God. Even as I slid between states of consciousness, I remember being unsure about that. The Major and I had often debated the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. It was a subject I had never been firm upon, and at that moment lying on what I feared was my deathbed, I was even less sure. The existence of God was not something I could assert, and if he would want me, was something even less certain. The Major got me to the surgeon in time to extract the bullet which fortunately had not pierced all the way through my shoulder, so I never found out one way or the other. Our friendship continued on greater than ever, strengthened by the bonds which can only be forged in the furnace of war. Still, I was struck by how different a scene it was now, nestled in the warm back parlour at the Christopher with freezing rain lashing the windows outside and a blazing fire inside. I was glad to see opposite me the familiar features of George Sydenham, my major, the man who had saved my life. Even in peace, he had never lost his military bearing, unable to fully relax into a chair. But his blue eyes, the same colour as the sweltering July sky under which I had nearly died, were warm and kind. We always met here, in the Christopher Inn at Eton. I had just delivered my son back to school here and was breaking the journey as I always did. I was happy to dally in Eton, not only because it gave me the opportunity of seeing the Major, but also of lingering before returning to my wife. Ours was not a happy home, and in truth often caused me to seek amusements elsewhere. I had never been to the Major's home, which I knew was not far from the Christopher Inn. I knew he lived alone, but even so, there was an unspoken line there which neither of us dared cross. It would mean a change in our friendship, I think we both knew, and neither of us were willing to risk altering something which was so precious. Besides, the inn was comfortable, and I was always happy to be with my major, conversing and recalling old times as we always did. We were not old men, though we were perhaps starting to feel the years a little. Do you remember those conversations we used to have about life after death and the existence of the soul? said Major Sydenham, swirling his brandy about his glass. I do, well, I said, thinking of the easy camaraderie of our days in the regiment and the many nights we'd sat up late talking about those very things. I think of them often, he said and how I constantly tried to persuade you to change your mind. And how you always failed, I said, watching him take a slow sip. I cannot credit that there's anything after this earthly life but to lie in quiet until all is dust. There's no way to convince you, William, and there never was. Unless it can be conclusively proved to me, no, I said. A light came into the Major's eyes. Well... Let us prove it to each other, he said. What do you mean? Let us make a promise, he said. Whichever one of us dies first, which event is a great way off, I hope, I said hurriedly. But he brushed past that and continued. Let us agree that he who dies first shall appear to the other by any means necessary and thus prove that there's more of human existence beyond death. Appear as a spectre, I said incredulously. A spectre, a spirit, a soul, however you like to call it. I was extremely dubious. 
I believed in ghosts even less than I believed in a host of angels waiting to welcome me into their throng. But my major seemed very serious. Very well, I said, unable to deny him anything he wanted. Let us say that he must appear to the other at midnight. Well, and as for the place, well, why not here? It is where we always meet, after all. If you insist, he said. But he was smiling, obviously pleased that I'd been drawn into his scheme. Perhaps it should be some while after the funeral, though, to allow enough time for whatever may come. Shall we say three nights? I did not care to talk of funerals, so swiftly changed the subject after that. But when we parted at the end of the night, I to my room in the inn and he to his horse and his home, he clasped my hand and reminded me of the promise we had made. Of course, I said, seeing that he meant it, and we went our ways. I curse myself now for not seeing something in him that night, for he must have had some inkling of what was happening to him, even if he did not want to say anything to me. But a letter written to me by his brother just a few short weeks after confirmed that my major had been very ill for some time, with a cancer of the stomach which had been steadily eating away at him until it caused his end. I cannot tell the extent of my grief. It tore through me like a cannon blast as wide as the sea. The Major had been my truest, dearest friend, the only person I had ever felt had truly seen me and had liked me in spite of it. My grief distracted me from the strange promise we had made, and I did not think of it as I rode back to Eton for his funeral. It was not until the sorry deed was done and the Major's body lying in earth, when those who had attended returned to his home to be received by his brother, that I was reminded of it. It was very strange to think that I had never been to this house where he lived, and I hardly heard the things which were said to me as I wandered through its rooms, looking at books and pictures and trying to imagine things about him which I had never considered. Perhaps seeing I was unfit for company, the Major's brother took me aside, leading me into a small library stuffed with books and decorated with naval maps. "'He left something for you,' he said, showing me a long, cloth-wrapped parcel. When I unwrapped it, I saw it was the Major's sword in its scabbard. It was the very sword which had saved my life, and I had a sudden image of him that day rushing to my rescue, wielding the sword so swiftly. It threatened to overwhelm me, and my knees almost buckled when a piece of notepaper fluttered out of the parcel. My heart leapt as I imagined some final letter to me, perhaps giving voice to something which neither of us had ever spoken of. But I was disappointed when I saw that there was only a single line written on it, with not even his name. Remember well our promise. What does that mean? the Major's brother asked, but I could not speak. My voice was choked with tears. I repaired to the Christopher Inn after that, where I determined to remain until I had seen whether my Major would appear or not, as he had said. I'm sorry to say that I drank more than I should have over those long three days, and slept heavily, troubled by dreams. So I was bleary with an aching head when it came to the third night after the Major's funeral. I called for candles and, perhaps foolishly, two glasses of the Major's favourite brandy. And then I sat and waited for him in the back parlour where we had always met. Two glasses, sir, said the tapster, raising his eyebrows. I'm waiting for someone, I said. Time proceeded on and the candles burned down. I drained my own brandy, but the other glass remained untouched. Midnight passed, and one, and it was almost two when the capster came to see if there was anything I wanted, as he was about to go to sleep himself. Didn't he come then, the person you was waiting for? he asked. Before I knew it, I had grabbed his shoulders and was hissing into his face. He would have come if he was able, I know it, I said. The next morning, I left the Christopher Inn, heart sick and heavy determined not to see that place again unless it was absolutely necessary. There had been no sign of a mortal life. My major was gone, lying cold in his grave, 
and the only thing I had left of him was his sword, which I carried next to my side, although I could not bear to remove it from its sheath, as the pain of seeing it was too great. I'm sorry to say that I passed the next few weeks in dissipation. My son was at school and I spent much time away from the house. I could hardly bear to look at my wife, or at any of the low company I sought out. I did not want to have to go back to the inn six weeks later, but it was the most convenient stopping point when collecting and returning my son from school, so I found myself there once more six weeks later. It was nearly Christmas time, and snow had fallen outside, covering the world in a white mantle. But I avoided the cosy back parlour and went to my room early, where I lay in bed staring up at the canopy. I did not think I would sleep, but I must have slept a little, for I thought I was dreaming when I heard a voice softly calling to me. Captain, Captain. Thinking it was time to wake and one of the inn's servants was rousing me, I drew back the curtains of the bed. To my surprise, the room was still in darkness, and I could see only by the gleam of the moonlight on the brilliant white snow outside the window. It was not the chambermaid, but there was somebody there. He looked pale and wasted, but he was as real as my own hand, shaking before me as I reached out to him. Captain, Captain, he said again. It was my major. I did not think in that moment of how this could be possible. When I looked at him, I was only glad to see his dear face again. I could not come at the time appointed, he said, but a promise is a promise. Major, you are here, I said helplessly. There were so many things I longed to say, how I'd missed him, how I'd felt the void at my side since he had died, but somehow I could see by the expression on his face that he knew it all, and I need say nothing. He drew back from me and walked about the room until he came to the table where I'd laid down the sword he'd left to me, the sword which had saved my life. Drawing it from its sheath, he held it up to inspect it. I flushed with shame, for I had not kept it so clean as I should have. Captain, Captain, this sword was not kept after this manner when I was living, he said, shaking his head. I leapt from the bed then, trying to get closer to him, to touch him perhaps, but he backed away from me. Do not touch me, he said. I am come to tell you what I always knew, but you denied. There is a god, and a very just and terrible one. You have fallen low, Captain, and if you do not turn over a new leaf, you shall find it so. There was no more. I would say he vanished, but it was more that he simply and suddenly wasn't there. I stayed rooted to the spot until the chambermaid came to make up the fire. I must have made a terrible sight, trembling and staring. But I had seen my major. He lived on, despite being dead. It was true. The first thing I did was to roll up my sleeves and clean his sword so that it shone brighter than it ever had. And I determined to follow my major's orders and mend my life. I broke off my acquaintance with those I should have taken care to avoid and I did my best to be attentive to my wife. I do not know if it will be enough, but I do know that when my own life does end, I shall at least have a chance of being reunited once more with my friend. So, Martin, what do you think of the ghostly major? Oh, well, I loved it. My heart feels a little bit bigger than it did Aww, before you started it reading swelled. it. It has, yeah. <laughs> it was a very sweet story. So I hadn't clocked that Eton was in Buckinghamshire. Yes, it is. OK, and I imagine a lot of people are familiar with Eton, but it's one of the most famous schools in England, certainly. Yes, a bit of a side note, just uh, just the reason that our hero was in Eton. Yes, and so Eton <laughs> his son. is in part famous because it's produced so many prime ministers and it's part of, I guess, what you'd call 
the old way of doing things. Yeah, in this the the establishment. It was sort of a very good private school that yes. you uh, sent your children to if you wanted them to succeed in life. What's your your male children? It's yeah, a good school. <laughs> indeed, and it's still seen that way in some quarters. Although there are a lot of people who really don't like that old boarding school tradition as it yes, was. Yes, absolutely. It used to be a bit of a feeder, didn't it? So you go Eton, Oxbridge, the government. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> the I House think, of Lords. <laughs> I think one of the interesting parts of your story and one of the things that I find sad about it because you know i went to boarding school so i can associate with some of that feeling and some of that sentiment is the way that those kinds of institutions and certain british traditions help to repress men in particular but also yes. women repressed all sorts of people and made them feel like they had to fit into particular set roles mm -hmm. so i thought it was really interesting that your characters were captain and major they didn't have names they referred to themselves by rank and they couldn't express what i think you'd you'd written in there very finely as basically a love story yeah i mean he he loved him very deeply yeah and that's that's as far as it went really uh, but I mean, the story is completely true. Well, that was, that was going to be my next question. So what what is the basis of this story? A, a tr well, supposedly true account written down by the cousin of the captain, wow. who was a doctor. And the captain came out and said that he'd had this experience, that he'd seen seen his major. Oh, and it, the major told him to fix his life up or he was going to have a bad time after death. It's such a, a classic ghost story setup, isn't it? You know, one of us has to come and meet the other mm. after death. There's been loads of good movies and ghost stories written about yes. that conceit. Um, and what I, was quite interesting about this one, though, was that it doesn't it doesn't work out. Like yeah. at the moment of drama when he's lit the candles and he's got, got the drink ready and the ghost doesn't show. Mm. And that was in the uh, the source as well but no reason was given as to why the ghost couldn't show yeah he just couldn't i thought it was interesting also that you know in life he didn't really want to be touched and in death he also didn't want to be touched mm -hmm. the great moment of intimacy they had was when he was wounded and he was covering his wound and helping to save his life got the sword there as again a, a pretty suggestive piece of uh, <laughs> yes, symbolism uh, a symbol <laughs> yeah buffing like crazy on that sword um so yeah i thought it was a brilliant story eleanor and uh yeah really appropriate for christmas mr james would be really proud Oh, thank you. I, I'm only sorry that you won't be able to see the ghost of the major if you go to the Christopher Inn in Eton today, because it was a very specific appearance just to this one person. So he doesn't habitually haunt. Well, wow, thank you very much, Eleanor. And uh, are you ready to talk correspondence? I am. Let's have it. OK, so no new reviews to read out this week, but, you know... <laughs> We don't take it personally. It's fine. <laughs> no, <laughs> but if you do have a moment, please head to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, drop some stars and write us a review. It would be a very kind Christmas gift from you to us. <laughs> and also, I found out this week that, weirdly, you can review Three Ravens on Amazon Podcasts and wow. Amazon Music. So if you use Amazon, then do please review us there as well, even if we do have very mixed feelings about Amazon in general. <laughs> we did thankfully receive some lovely messages messages and emails this week including from rachel who sent us a lovely email about how much she was enjoying season three with a beautiful painting of a hair oh, in so the snow gorgeous. very stunning and from sheila who wrote to us about last week's gloucestershire episode yes so sheila pointed out that as we mentioned in the episode bristol is no longer part of gloucestershire sorry if we weren't clear about that and then she shared a fascinating anecdote from her uncle's time as a police officer in bristol before and after world war ii sheila wrote the river avon which flows through the city docks was once the boundary between bristol and somerset occasionally a body would be found in the docks and the unpleasant task of getting it ashore and dealing with the paperwork would take many hours so, she says, if the body was found early on a cold night shift, then a police officer would be diligent in getting it ashore and then return to a nice warm police station to deal with the admin. <laughs> However, if it was coming towards the end of a night shift, then the body was likely to be given a hefty shove with a boat hook to send it over to the Somerset Bank. <laughs> Needless to say, the same attitude prevailed in Somerset. According to my uncle, a 
the corpse sometimes made several crossings before it was dealt with. <laughs> oh, isn't that macabre? Brilliant. Thanks, Sheila. And we're absolutely certain that never would a corpse be sent back and forth across county lines in this day and age. Mm-hmm. Not in this country. Not today. No siree. <laughs> Thank you also to Lisa for sharing some hilarious 19th century postcards of Krampus chasing ladies in the Three Ravens podcast mm-hmm. group. And to Stella, Ash, Patty, Sabrina and Kelly for your links and photos too. If you haven't already, join the Three Ravens podcast group. It's fun. Kelly's papier-mâché boar's head was a particular recent highlight for me. Awesome stuff. Yes, absolutely amazing. As for our likers, commenters and super sharers this week, special thank yous go to Laura, Kathleen, Anne, Tony and Pete on Facebook, Ginger Noodle UK, Alice O'Malley, Claire, It's Jelly Art and The Painted Bunny Illustration on Instagram and Paco, Shadowhouse Publishing, Bevan Thomas, Weird Wednesday and Mystic Moon on the artist formerly known as Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for all your lovely communications. Please keep them coming and do get in touch with us via social media, facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens Podcast, Instagram at Three Ravens Podcast and X at Three Ravens Pod. Or you can email us at Three Ravens Podcast at gmail.com, which is also the place to send your entries for our thousand word flash fiction competition. Keep listening throughout December as we're well into our advent now (laughs) loosely inspired by the song the 12 days of christmas we're taking a wander through some of the bizarre traditions which may have inspired the lyrics to the song if that doesn't have you feeling christmassy enough we also have some lovely new merchandise up on the three ravens shop in our current wintry colors and if you'd like still more goodies please consider subscribing to our patreon for just three dollars or six dollars a month we've got lots of exclusives including martin's brand new snow queens episode Mm. released last thursday bit of a tearjerker gotta say well i tried my best to do a nice story and <laughs> thank you to the lovely people on patreon by the way who have been so kind about it and where will we be wandering to next week we will not be wandering at all but we will be decking the halls and feasting as next monday is christmas day what sale what sale indeed for we have our three ravens christmas special coming out on the 25th brimming with christmas and yule folklore and history if you need some respite from cooking and chatting and being around your family or you just fancy hanging out with us too well we got you covered in addition to exploring the history and folkloric traditions of christmas and yule we'll also be telling an all new seasonal story so it should be quite the occasion but before then we've got a dying arts episode coming out on midwinter which is going to be all about christmas craft oh i'm so looking forward to it i haven't done much crafting so far this christmas i'd really like to no hopefully we'll get the chance and get some ideas from the episode fantastic plus our film club episode about the delightfully wintry japanese folk horror movie kwaidan is out next thursday yes thursday after christmas and after that things return to normal or don't as they? normal as things ever get in the three ravens nest <laughs> in the meantime then while our story's gone that way we'll go this way and remember don't whistle until you're out of the woods Thanks and credit go to Buckinghamshire Folk Tales by Terry Howie, the British Folklore website, the Modern Antiquarian blog, History Press and Curious Buckinghamshire by Roger Long. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent a bridge gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man, with a down derry derry.